Ray, let's talk a bit about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. First of all, tell me, what is the difference between blockchain and regular applications from a software perspective? At its most simplest level, blockchain is an evolution in database. The most important feature is a feature of being decentralized. There's no one controlling or operating the software. When you take away the centralized authority, it's completely up to the people, it's completely up to the cloud in a sense to determine the evolution of the software. Therefore, when you have an application, you have a situation when you want certainty of transaction, number one, and number two, you want anonymity, those are the two core features in which decentralized applications make sense. There's times when you want a bank, a centralized operator. There's times when you don't want a bank, something like Bitcoin. But really, the way we should look at this is as follows. When we look at WeChat, when we look at Ali, or WePay, sorry, when we look at Alipay and we look at Apple Pay, those are three of the largest electronic payment systems in the world. What Bitcoin helps represent is that, that market share of payments where you need anonymity mm -hmm. and certainty of payment. Generally speaking, that's the nefarious underground of the internet. Now let's just look at another market, the, the currency market. On, on average, on a daily basis, the currency market trades five to six trillion dollars per day. Now the electronic payments market, that is growing and that's in the trillions of dollars as well. Okay, so in a decentralized application universe like that, you're referring to anonymity as a key feature and that's been very attractive to a lot of people on the internet who don't want to be identified. And so my question is, how sustainable is a global financial system that features anonymity as one of its key components how attractive is that going to be to governments who want to make sure that people aren't breaking the law, embezzling funds, uh, you know, conducting transactions in illegal weapons, drugs? I mean, how, how does that resolve itself? The paradox in this whole thing about cryptocurrencies is as follows. The moment you bring a centralized authority like a bank or a central bank into the equation, you, the moment you do that, you take away the core feature of the whole system the fact that it's decentralized. So hybrid models will exist, so a bank will deploy blockchain internally to save some operating costs. So let's talk about Ethereum. What is Ethereum? Ethereum is an app store of decentralized applications. Been around for about a year, and if we compare that app store versus the Apple's app store one year, what do we have? So the number one app that I saw on Ethereum's app store is a, a 1.8x multiplier app. It multiplies the amount of ether you can collect. Now that's interesting, you know when you look at the hashtags for the search hashtags, one of the hashtags is Ponzi scheme, hashtag Ponzi scheme. We have very few apps that are actually getting any sort of real tangible value. The ones that are valuable are the ones where you want certainty of transaction and an anonymity. There's times when you just want to make sure the transaction goes through and the key is you do not want anyone else to stop it. That's the decentralized aspect versus mm. the centralized. There is value in that. If, like again, I'm just looking at it from an outsider's perspective. I run a venture fund and we fund early stage companies, including companies in this world. Any of these currencies, I say look, what they really are are assets and they're derivative assets. So all of us in the, on the street are very familiar with derivatives. So all these currencies and so on are simply just derivatives. And when you look at a derivative and what drives its value, in the case of something like Bitcoin, there's definitely a net asset value. If you wanted to, you could calculate what were the electricity costs invested, what's the overhead of the computing, and say, look, on a net asset value or book value basis, there was this much invested capital to create this much of a virtual asset. Anything above that calculation is the premium that the market gives to the, to the certainty of transaction, again, I started to repeat myself, right. and the anonymity. So of course there's a dark web, right. and that's where this uh, currency really flourishes. To put it in perspective, the global currency market's five to six trillion, and so this will have a certain market share. You should assume, what it, you can assume whatever market share is, apply it and say that's, that's this market. The most common aspect associated with Ethereum, to me, as a non blockchain market participant is these Ether coins, which is a cryptocurrency. Now, Ethereum, I've also heard, is a more useful blockchain application than Bitcoin because it can do these smart contracts, or in other words, it can attach conditions for certain aspects of any transaction, any point in the transaction, need to be met and verified by all of the nodes associated with that blockchain. 
and that constitutes a smart contract because it has these layers of things that have to happen in order for the contract to proceed. That's all fine. But when it comes to the cryptocurrencies, you say that the net asset value should be no more or less than the entire resource cost that has been brought to bear on it to create the, the asset class, I guess, is for want of a better term. But my question is, if the guys who start block or Bitcoin rather have now created two forks. There's Bitcoin Gold and there's Segwit2x. And on my Coinbase account, which I'm now you know, trying to understand it, it tells me that if they determine that Bitcoin Gold is stable and valuable, that I will receive one Bitcoin Gold for every Bitcoin in my account. In the case of Bitcoin Segwit2x, they've determined that it, this is definitely going to be valuable and stable. And so after, I think it's November 18th, I am going to receive a 2x, Bitcoin 2x in my account for every Bitcoin I own. So that right away tells me that the whole concept of a maximum number of Bitcoins being yeah. 21 million is going to limit dilution and, and uh, inflation renders it sort of false. Separate issues, okay, so we have to deconstruct. Then let's go to the other comment about the asset value of, of a currency. So let's stop calling it a currency and let's just call it an asset. A crypto asset, right? Sure. So number one. Number two is let's just say that this asset's value is the value of the cost invested to create the asset, which is the electricity and the overhead and computing. But the premium on top of it, we can't discount that premium. There is, like, I don't know, it just went through 7,000. I'm not saying its price discovery is currently accurate. What I'm saying is a premium is definitely warranted. Here's why. The reason why you d it deserves a premium is the same reason you, why a brand exists. A brand is an intangible asset, a asset, but when you go to CIBC, you know that CIBC is going to take care of you with your bank account transaction. Similarly, what, what, what Bitcoin has achieved is critical mass and status through its network mm -hmm. that when a transaction happens, that the transaction will occur. Almost with as much certainty as you would with a centralized system like a bank. Now, then the question becomes, why do you need it to be decentralized? In most cases, in almost all cases, PayPal will be superior to Bitcoin. How easy is it to do Bitcoin? It's actually not easy for the average person. How easy to do PayPal? It's easy like this. You don't even need a PayPal account. You can do it through just your credit card. Sure. The fundamental applications, user interfaces, are all very archaic in, in relative comparisons to any of the current generation of apps. So what, what, what results is a niche, a niche audience. And that niche audience is those applications where you need those two features. Now let's take one really crazy example. Let's assume we create a search engine which is decentralized. So now the question becomes, Google's already indexed and searched the web. Is there a value to having a decentralized Google? And actually, yeah. Because if you want to be anonymous web surfing, then Google's been collecting all that data all that time. Mm -hmm. So a decentralized web, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, web search. If I was Google, I'd be very concerned about things like blockchain. Sure. Now that makes sense. Plus but we've seen that Google will order results to favor its advertising business. If it's decentralized, it's the ultimate in crowdsourcing, where the, it's the most democratic system possible. Ethereum's an interesting story because the Ethereum launched, it had the, the $150 million crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, the most successful in the history, refunded that because it was hacked. And so what everyone now has seen is a re, relaunch of Ethereum. And, and with a lot of the issues being addressed. Now, it, this big issue that was flagged before was very obvious. It was a huge amount of ether was displaced. But what, what now we have to be concerned about is the small things that are less noticeable. And these are the same issues that every centralized software manager faces. And what we have here is a really, like a, an assumption, a major assumption, that the, that the capital markets nature of, the, of that environment will create a favorable situation for them to correct the problems. The jury's still out because there's a big difference between hyper-speculation and an asset class just going through the roof by some sort of mad rush of, of recognition, of right. information, right? There's a difference between that and, and a fundamental asset value. And it doesn't take away the fact that, you know, like I said, 
there's value to Bitcoin because of that anonymity. Before cannabis was starting to get legalized, would you go to the park and pay for your cannabis with a credit card? Chances are you wouldn't, but would you pay with Bitcoin? Definitely. Okay, well, so that sort of returns to an original question that I had for you, which is how tolerant will governments be of a system that permits criminal activity? I mean, because from what you're telling me, the dark web is a place where what, what use is there for the dark web outside of illegal activity? So the analogy about governments and cryptocurrencies is similar to, in a way, uh, what's happening with the Apple App Store and a challenge that has emerged recently to the App Store market, which is something called HTML5. HTML5 are web-based apps, and so you bypass the need for downloading through the App Store. So then the question becomes, there's situations where HTML5 makes sense, and then there's situations where Apple's curation, their, their, their efforts they do to make sure nobody's stealing your data, their efforts that they make to make sure that you're staying uh, you know, within certain norms of certain guidelines. So this brings us right back to currencies. There's a time when the government makes sense to be the manager. There's a time that when the bank makes sense to be the manager of your currency. And then there, there's a time when it makes sense for nobody to be a manager of your currency. It's those times that these cryptocurrencies really flourish. Interesting, right? We're gonna leave it there for now, and we're gonna take apart the entire blockchain and cryptocurrency argument in a series of discussions going forward. Thanks very much for joining me today.